here with Nathaniel Jensen, PhD, or he's a research biologist. So, uh, Mr. Jensen, talk to us about how biology supports creation. Let me back up even further and say, how does biology deal with evolution? Because there's something many people don't realize. When Darwin wrote his book, he took a gigantic scientific risk on the origin of species is fundamentally a genetic question. You see traits that define species, the zebra stripes, the giraffe's neck, elephant's trunk. Well, elephants produce long-trunked creatures, giraffes produce long-necked creatures. Something is inherited that defines what the species is. So to ask what's the origin of species is to ask a question of inheritance, which means that you're asking a fundamentally genetic question. Well, we didn't know that DNA was the physical basis for inheritance until 1953 to make a long story short. And once we discovered that, then it took another several decades to get DNA sequences from species around the planet, the estimated two million or more species that exist. We still don't have all the DNA sequences. So we really haven't been able to directly, scientifically evaluate Darwin's answer until now. So it's a really exciting time to be revisiting, basically, the origin of species, to get the direct data and not argue about this indirect stuff, for which there are multiple explanations and to ask, well, from whom do species come? How are they related? Where are they not related? When did they originate? How did they originate? Is it selection, natural selection? Is it something different? Where do they originate? Of course, in Darwin's day, people thought that God created species, in, well, species then, uh, in their current locations. Of course, if you read the Bible carefully, Genesis 1 to 11, it's obvious that the whole world was flooded and that they restarted on Ararat and must have migrated to their current location. So Darwin's arguments for migration we would endorse, by and large, because scripture says they started in Ararat and migrated out to their current locations. So a lot of the research I'm doing these days, and that's really most of my, my task day to day, is answering those big questions. From whom do they originate? How do they originate? When and where? And also a lot of specific application on the human species in general. What about Noah, his wife, his sons and their wives? Is there a genetic signature of a population bottleneck, a reduction from a lot of people to eight and then a restart? And some of the research I'm doing right now, and even that's running over the weekend, is looking at the different ethnic groups around the globe and one particular subset of DNA sequence that has strong implications that goes back to just three, the three lives of Noah's sons. So that's sort of a big picture on what I'm doing day to day. Wow, that's, that's very interesting. Um, one thing that I've noticed on the park is that technically, generally, we hear people talk about Noah couldn't have put all those species on the ark. But the Bible doesn't say species, it says patterns. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, the key word, of course, the Old Testament written in Hebrew. The key word then is what's the Hebrew word that we translate species or kind of that sort of thing. It's the word mean, so there's, it's not species per se. And if you look at the flood account in particular, God says bring male and female. Uh, so there's a, an implication that if, if two individuals, two species can breed, they're part of the same kind. And breeding studies have demonstrated that even though one of the eight or so definitions for species is, has to do with reproduction. There are species today that are still reproductively compatible, like a lion and a tiger can produce offspring. A horse and a zebra, a horse and a donkey, a, a donkey and a zebra can produce offspring. So not species, but probably not even genus, but maybe a level of family, if you think about the traditional classification categories. All horses, donkeys, zebra species, seven living today, would belong to the same family. All cats, large and small, from the house cat to the lion, belong to the same family. So Noah appears to have taken two felids, two members as a general rule, of each family on board the ark. And since today we see lots of species in each family, new species must have formed in the few thousand years since the flood. And we'd also say one family cannot be changed into another. After all, if they could, there's no point in having an ark. If you could just you know, have a few whales survive and then they evolve back onto the land, there's no point in saving anything on the ship. So the fact that there needed to be an ark shows by itself, that one kind of creature cannot take and change into another kind of creature. That would be macroevolution. We do see microevolution, small changes. Can you talk about that? So one of the key questions we're trying to answer right now in understanding the origin of species, and one that Darwin had no access to because of the entire community's ignorance of genetics, is what is the origin of the genetic information behind traits? And one of the most important elements of this is the fact that so many species, like humans, have biparental inheritance. You have a mother and a father. It's not asexual like bacteria, it's sexual reproduction. So that means both parents contribute something to the offspring genetically. And in humans, as an example, it's not that dad contributes one arm, let's say, and mom the other arm. Dad contributes the complete set of information, 
mom contributes and completes it, and so there's varieties that you can kind of mix and match and choose from to produce the final outcome. And so the research I've been doing and just published uh, two months ago made some arguments to say, even though the original kinds had no physical parents because they were created, there's good evidence to say that God created them genetically diverse from the start. So I have two copies of DNA that are different because my parents are different. In the beginning, I think we can argue that those kinds have two different copies of DNA within themselves. Once you have that, all the basic evolutionary biology people have established, population genetics and these sorts of fields over the years say you can very quickly, in a single generation, produce all sorts of variety. You go back to the where most modern genetic textbooks start, 1865, Gregor Mendel, he crosses pea plants. Let's say green seeded with yellow seeded, you cross them, yellow is dominant, all the offspring of yellow seeds. Well, if you intercross those, it's not that green was destroyed. Green reappears and yellow in the next generation. So I'm saying that state is basically what God created the creatures like. They will look like one thing, but just a few crosses, boom, and you got all sorts of variety. You can do it in a single generation. So no, it didn't need hundreds of dogs. He only needed two. Two dogs, and in fact, I would say two canids. So the dog family has everything from wolves to coyotes to foxes and so forth. And he could easily produce the 36 or 37 species, whatever the number is today. In, in a short amount of time. What about dinosaurs? Noel would have taken those on board the ark as well. There's some question about how many dinosaur kinds there are, but what we just discussed applies equally well there. Not two of every species of dinosaur, but two of each kind of dinosaur. Again, it's a little bit harder to establish ancestry in the absence of genetics. Kind of hard to do genetics on dead things sitting on the ground, uh, despite scientists' best efforts and claims otherwise. And so, two of every kind, and again, we all we put on display the biggest ones because those capture my imagination and everyone else's imagination. They're just so huge. But Noah likely would not have taken those for a number of reasons, not just so he can try to cram them in, but the purpose of bringing them on board the ark, the explicit purpose in Genesis 7, is to preserve their seed. Unfortunately, I think the New King James is species there, but the word is the same thing you see later on in Genesis 12 to Abraham and his seed. It's clearly meaning offspring. It's sort of a, a recreation event. Instead of speaking things into existence from nothing, God saves him on the ark and says, restart. There's a similar, you know, be fruitful and multiply there as you have in Genesis 1. And so, which creatures are gonna be most reproductively healthy or be able to reproduce the most and repopulate the earth after the flood? Well, the juveniles or the, the young adults, not the grandfathers. And so, dinosaurs are reptiles and reptiles just keep growing. What we put on display in museums are probably the grandparents or the great grandparents and those are not representative of the juveniles, the most reproductively fertile, that Noah likely would have taken on board the ark. So dinosaurs really then are just lizards or reptiles, not lizards, but reptiles that have lived for a long time. The big ones are ones that have lived for a long time, and the reason we don't see them today is probably the same reason we don't see 70% of mammal families that we don't see today. Dinosaurs get the breast because they fascinate the imagination, but the vast majority of mammal families no longer exist today. And so that's some of the things people see on the board of the ark here is some of the extinct kinds that Noah would have seen but have since died out. So what about the law of biogenesis? Doesn't it say something like life cannot come from non-life? We all we see is life coming from non-life. Uh, we've never seen life spontaneously arise. Scientists have made progress in synthesizing parts of life in the lab. It wouldn't surprise me if they do because what have we been saying all along, that it requires super intelligence to create life, and if we see super intelligent people create life, well, that proves the point. So that really just proves that it took intelligence to create life in the first place. Exactly. It makes sense. So where can our readers learn more about biology and how it supports creation? You can go to the Answers in Genesis website. The sort of the first level you'll see at the Ark Encounter site, let's say the unbelievers, and really a lot of the exhibits that we've done here have been designed because we anticipate a lot of unbelievers coming through to be, to meet them where they're at. So not assuming, let's say, necessarily a Bible background and, and Christianese and that sort of thing. We put the facts as they are, but not assuming that, oh, you've read Genesis, or oh, you you know, you know the backwards and forward Genesis 1, we're gonna tell you the key foundational points and the scientific evidence that flows from it. So our Encounter would be sort of your entry point. Uh, Answers in Genesis has, I don't know how many articles, and we're continually updating our research. I'm doing a series that's going on right now. Uh, like an 11-part series on the origin of species after the flood. In fact, this past weekend's article, it comes up on Saturday typically, was did Darwin argue for the recent origin of species? And I think you can make an argument from his first two chapters using his analogies that species must have originated recently, not millions of years ago.
maybe last question, unless I can't know that comes to mind. Some say that since there are no transitional forms, that maybe uh, evolution happens spontaneously, that an animal, for example, uh, an alligator or a lizard laid an egg and a bird came out. Talk about that. The hopeful monster idea, I'd say it's probably been rejected by the majority of the scientific community ever since Darwin. They've basically been gradualists. They would say we can find creatures that blend the features of two different species, which, from my perspective, the, the definition of transitional form has has been massaged a little bit. When you think about it, what creatures blend the features of two different creatures? The platypus blends all sorts of features. Uh, and furthermore, let's say we find a bona fide transitional form, something that's like half amphibian, half fish, that they would predict to, to find if, if fish did evolve into land creatures. Well, you look at what humans design, and since we're made in the image of God, I think that gives us a sense, maybe a taste for the principles God might have used in Genesis chapter one. Humans design transitional forms by that definition. Military engineers design ships for the water, they design tanks for the land, and if they want to go between those two, they design amphibious assault vehicles that blend the features of two very different structures. They are not as good as tanks in the land, they're not as good as boats and uh, ships in the ocean, but they are perfect and well adapted, well suited to that transitional environment and exceed both of those in their ability to go back and forth. So even if there was a whole list of transitional forms, this is what humans design, how much more so would God design creatures that blend features for transitional environments. Makes sense. So if there are transitional forms, it doesn't prove evolution anyway. It's ambiguous with respect to the origins question. Science is an inductive method of reasoning. You don't start with the premise and deduce. You start with observations and try to infer principles, which means you have to eliminate competing explanations. And so if you've got an observation that does not distinguish, it does not eliminate, eliminate creation or evolution, it's irrelevant to the debate. So, in other words, you don't come to the problem with your your uh, worldview already in place. You let the evidence tell you what to do. Yeah, and because it's inductive, you're always going to be bringing some idea to it. And because humans are finite, there's always a chance you've missed something, which is why we have a system of peer review, and mm -hmm. you try to get as many minds to bear on the question. Or give an example from graduate school. I used to think the biggest challenge to getting ideas published and such was my peers, no, or maybe my competitors. No, they're actually your, your scientific enemies, so to speak, or your greatest allies, and your greatest, real greatest enemy is actually the data. You can have the best hypothesis in the world and it might be wrong, and the only way you're going to know it's wrong is if someone can say, look, this test refutes your idea. Yeah and there's a good chance I've missed it because I can only think of so many things at once and having multiple people say, oh, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? That's what helps narrow down what hypotheses still stand, which ones have been rejected, and that's the biggest hurdle in the creation evolution debate. The evolutionists tend to reject and not even consider or solicit the input of creationists who have a lot to bring on the question, bring to bear on the question, and could really help advance the debate by leaps and bounds. So an honest look at the data really would support creation and reject evolution. Yes, especially I'd say in my field of genetics that we've been doing, there's I think some really new strong challenges in the article that will be coming out this Saturday. We'll, t we'll talk about some of those, not only on the term question of ancestry, but the question of time. There's a genetic clock that ticks in species that points towards a recent origin, not a millions of years origin. Do you have any final thoughts for our readers? Check out our website, Answers in Genesis. It's a huge issue and uh, best way to stay abreast and, and, and be brought up to speed on what's going on, what's happening, is to, to keep up to speed there and, and dive into the resources we have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.